You know your eyes is the most important thing you got. And once they're gone, they're just gone, that's all. You never want to get them back, no way. Now your mama's always right. And the sooner we get this new bulb into this lamp, the better we're going to be. Now, uh oh, oh. Don't you know that phone just got to ring its... All right, all right, I'm coming. Honey, do like I say and put this bulb in the lamp before you read any more. One of these days I'm going to pull that... That's right, you know. Well, well, my dear, don't just sit there. Go help! My glasses. Steady now, steady. Careless children. Ouch! Young lady, you should be more careful. Glass, you know, light bulbs made of glass, my dear, should be treated with respect. However, no real harm done. None at all, our glass is made very strong and tough. Oh, allow me to introduce myself. <clears throat> uh, Professor J. Lumen Lightly, Ph.D., G.E., President of the Little Men's Chowder Marching and Lamp Lighting Society. Do, sir. I'm I'm Nancy. Fine, fine. Excellent name, excellent. Oh, uh, pardon me a moment while I generate. <laughs> now don't be alarmed, Nancy. I'll be right with you. why this book is so interesting that it kept you from putting in the new bulb. Oh, fairy tales of the ages. Ah, very commendable. Very commendable. Fairy stories are excellent reading. Excellent. However, if you really enjoy that sort of thing, there's more magic right here than you'll find in a dozen such books. Right there? Certainly, Nancy. Here in the lamp book. Now just hop inside for a minute and I'll show you. But I couldn't. I'm too big. Oh, fiddlesticks. Now, you leave everything to me. Now, just a second while I get up to speed. Here we go. <laughs> well, I see you made it. Now for the real magic. Just look at that filament, that curly wire in front of you that looks like a big spring. It's the heart of the lamp, so to speak. And remember that you're only about two inches high at the moment. Actually, this filament is only five-eighths of an inch long. Yet, it's coiled from a tungsten wire 20 inches long and much finer than a single hair from your pretty head. In fact, to get it so fine, it has to be drawn through tiny holes in diamonds. Each little coil is only one thousandth of an inch away from its neighbor. But they mustn't touch each other or the lamp won't work properly. Now, how's that for magic, hmm? However, the tighter the filament is, the better it'll work because it won't lose so much heat. So we coil it again, which gets it down to its final length of only five-eighths of an inch. Coiled coils are only 7,000. None of the tiny coils or the bigger ones touch each other. By the way, Nancy, do you know how much a thousandth of an inch is? Well, it, it must be very small. Uh, small indeed. It's just about two-thirds of one-twelfth of nothing divided by seven. <laughs> yes, sir. And another thing. The filament controls the lamp life so that we have to regulate the filament design because the total radiation varies as the fourth power of the absolute temperature. And the oh, life... Oh, Professor, I think I'm lost in that fourth power. Oh, sorry. I, I got wrapped up in my subject. Uh, but here's what I mean. How long a light bulb lasts depends largely on how hot the filament is burned. When our scientists know how a bulb is to be used, they control the temperature of the filament to give the proper balance between the most useful light and the longest life. How do you mean? Like this. A filament burned only red hot doesn't give much light, but will last for years. That's as it is in a heat lamp. But when you need a tremendous amount of light from a bulb, 
its filament has to burn at a superheat to produce that light, but will live as a photographic lamp. The bulbs you use in your home are so made that the filament burns at just the right temperature to give you lots of light economically useful. I suppose, Nancy, that you think a fine watch is a real marvel of accuracy. All those little screws and gears and things. But when you stop to think of the truly amazing precision and uniformity of this tiny bit of coiled wire, and when you also realize that we make millions of these little marvels all just alike, and remember that they're only one of many parts of a light bulb which you can buy anywhere in the United States for only a few pennies, I think you'll agree with me that you are at this moment standing inside an object as amazing as anything in your book of fairy tales. Ah, yes. But we must get you out now. You, you do look a little bit uh, cramped. There we are. As good as new. But don't go away. We're just getting started on this magic business. <clears throat> e to the X plus the square root of two. Lamp rise up and light up too. Aha. Now then, here's a little number with a lot of very special magic. But it's just like the other one. Well, we'll see about that. Here, Nancy, take a good look. My goodness, it's tiny. Is it really a lamp? I mean, will it light up? Certainly. This midget grain of wheat lamp is used by doctors. It's only one sixteenth of an inch wide and one half an inch long. It burns less than two tenths of a watt and it would take 3,500 of these lamps to weigh one pound. Lamps of this type enable surgeons to perform delicate operations and examinations right inside the human body. These doctors have just used one to fish the safety pin out of this little boy's gizzard. And believe me, he's plenty happy about the whole thing. These tiny lamps are truly lifesavers. Now then, here's another little number that may interest you. <laughs> Surprise you, eh, Nancy? Never underestimate the old professor. Well, well, go ahead. Pick it up and look it over. That's a 50,000 watt bulb. But this one lamp uses as much electricity for light as the most powerful radio stations use for broadcasting. Why, the pound and a half of tungsten in this lamp would make filaments for 21 million grain of wheat lamps. Well, Nancy, you've seen the smallest and the largest light bulbs in the world. That gives you some idea of the extremes that we go to to give folks the kind of light bulbs they need. Now I want to show you a few of the thousands and thousands of shapes and sizes in between. Because there's magic in every one of them, too. Now here's a bulb that has a built-in reflector to put lots of light just where you want it. The bulb itself is made with a special reflector shape. Next, a thin layer of aluminum is vaporized on the inside of the glass. The bulb is then filled to just the right level with an acid which eats away the aluminum coating from the front of the bulb. The acid is then taken out and the bulb washed and dried, leaving the reflector part shiny and the front section clear. Bulbs of this type have a multitude of uses for flood and spotlighting. And when made of extra hard glass, they serve outdoors as well. Now the same bulb with a different filament gives us infrared heat radiation to take the aches and pains from sore and tired muscles. The same radiation that cuts down the time of many drying tasks from hours to minutes. Still another use of this bulb shape gives us an entirely different reflector lamp. It is the sun lamp which is rich in vitamin D and provides us with tanning ultraviolet radiation of nature's sunshine. Today, these three lamps bring the light, warmth, and health protection of sunlight indoors whenever and wherever we want it. Now we come to one of the most revolutionary lamps ever developed the all-glass sealed beam headlamp that never grows dim. Your daddy has them on his new car, Nancy. 
And he'll find that right up to the end of its long, useful life, the lamp will be giving as much light as it did the day he bought his car. This is possible because the entire headlamp is a one-piece unit. The accurately molded reflector and lens are made of rugged, hard glass and are fused together so the dirt and moisture can never enter to affect the mirror-like built-in reflecting surface. The whole thing is one big light bulb. You see, Nancy, old-type headlights were made of separate parts. Lens, reflector, bulb, and gasket. And after a short time, the bulb got black, dirt and moisture tarnished the reflector, and cut the light way down. In half, in many instances. Yes, in the old days, your dad's headlights were pretty difficult to drive behind. But now, he can see comfortably and drive with much greater safety. He gets new car lighting always. The same revolutionary principle has been applied to many other types of lamps, such as the airplane landing light and the locomotive headlamp, which certainly have to be brilliant and dependable. Goodness, Professor Lightly, I never realized there were so many different kinds of such important light bulbs. That's true, Nancy. When most people think of light bulbs, they think only of the bulbs they use in their homes. They aren't aware of the fact that all the other lamp bulbs used in science, commerce, and industry have come from the same research that created the bulbs in their homes. Yet there are other lamps working indirectly to make their living easier and more pleasant. Why, we even make a bulb that works deep down under the ocean to help divers in their dangerous but necessary work. Now, just a moment while I get my magic wand. Now then, we'll go on a little trip and take a look at a few of these unusual lamps. Are you ready? Here we go. Integral X dx times 3. May the powers of light fly away with thee. P Professor! Professor, where are you? Right here, Nancy, right here. Now, don't be frightened. All right, you. Break it up. Now then, right over there you can see one of our underwater lights being used. That diver's recovering valuable material from a sunken ship, and he needs plenty of good, reliable light to work with. These diver's lamps are made to stand the water pressure down to 600 feet. You know, seeing that lamp shining out underwater reminds the old professor of something interesting about all light bulbs, which is that they must be very, very dry inside. Why, the inside of your regular house bulb is drier than the Sahara Desert. We have to make it that way because even the tiniest bit of water in a bulb will cause it to blacken before it should. Why, even one drop of water divided among one half million lamps would make every single one turn black too soon. Now, just another example, Nancy, of the care it takes to make a good light bulb. A light bulb that costs only a few pennies. The same attention to detail that enables our diver friend to carry on his difficult and dangerous work. It's, it's all wonderful and exciting, but it's sort of cold and damp and... Absolutely right. I'll have you out of here in a jiffy. Let A equal Z and the Q group be found. Light take us deep down under the ground. Here we are, my dear. Cozy, isn't it? Yes, it is a little better than the bottom of the ocean. Why, certainly. Now look at those miners, busy as bees. Not a bit worried. Now then, notice the lamps on their hands. That's what I particularly wanted you to see here. In the old days, miners used lanterns burning oil or gas, but they didn't give much light and they were dangerous. So we developed a special lamp bulb which uses a very rare and expensive gas called krypton because it makes them give more light. And since the miners have to carry their own power supply, they need bulbs that give as much light as possible. Saving lives, making work easier, that's our job. And speaking of safety reminds me of something else about our old friend, the 60-watt house bulb. Safety is built right into it, too. Every light bulb of 40 watts or more used for general lighting carries its own fuse. 
In older type lamp bulbs, which had no fuse, electricity might jump between the wires, causing an arc which would break the bulb. To prevent this, the lamp fuse was developed. The lead wires of the bulb are different. One's a copper wire, the other is a much finer special alloy wire. It is the fuse. Now, in this modern bulb, the fuse air burns out and so stops the arc before it has a chance to break the bulb. It's just another example of the kind of thinking constantly used to make more and better lamps at lower cost, whether they're for a miner working a mile underground or for a pilot in a plane in the sky. I think it'd be fun. Bye. All right, and we might just as well pick up your easy chair so you feel comfortable. <clears throat> Y plus Z times 2X squared. Light fly us high, fly us through the air. Well, how's this, Nancy? Better, huh? Oh, this is wonderful. I wish I had one of those magic wands so I could fly around whenever I wanted to. Nothing simpler, Nancy. Here. However, that wand is good for much more important things than flying around through the air. It's a fluorescent light tube. And if you look at it closely, you'll see some very interesting things. In the first place, the fluorescent lamp makes its light in an entirely different way. It is called an electric discharge lamp. In the filament lamp, the electric current moves through the wire filament heating it white hot and making the light. In the fluorescent lamp, the electricity travels through the gas inside the tube instead of through a filament. In simplest terms, a fluorescent lamp is made of a glass tube. Sealed in each end are wires called electrodes. The tube is filled with argon gas and mercury vapor and is coated on the inside with a thin layer of fluorescent powders called phosphors. Electricity flowing from one end of the tube to the other causes the mercury vapor to produce invisible ultraviolet energy. When this ultraviolet energy strikes the fluorescent coating on the inside of the tube, it is transformed into light. There are a million ways to make this fluorescent tube, but there's only one combination of these elements which is the best. Also, great precision through mass production has created the most efficient and economical light source yet developed by man. Come along and we'll try a little magic with your new wand. There is a factory that looks as though it could use a little light. Ah, yes, just as I thought. You see, Nancy, these workmen do not have enough light. Bad lighting is the poorest economy possible. More products are discarded, the working men are easily tired, there are more accidents, and the work in general is slower and less efficient. Point your magic wand at the building and see what happens. Aha, that's the ticket. In well-lighted shops, the workers can see what they are making. Products are better, made with greater speed, and at lower cost. Office work, too, is less expensive and more accurate. Oh, yes, Nancy. This fluorescent wand of yours gives better living to lots of people because it makes their work easier. This is especially important in schoolrooms. Inadequate lighting must be replaced, for above all, we want plenty of good light for the young eyes of children. Of course, to make it comfortable, we'll have to shield the brightness of the tubes. There. Now that's what I call real magic. Useful magic. And that's just one of the many ways a class can be relighted. Now the students will do better work, learn more, and enjoy doing it. Ah, oh, when it comes to study, Nancy, there's nothing like throwing a little light on the subject. <laughs> We've brought more enjoyment and comfort to grown-up eyes, too, by bending our magic wands into circles. We call them fluorescent circ lines. They give abundant light that is smooth to look at and to see by. And speaking of eyes, I believe I see trouble approaching. Yes, definitely. Airborne disease germs. You better let me take the magic wand. These fellows may be too much for you. I'll just change the glass so that the ultraviolet can come through. Here we go. P times Z plus ultra V 
Rays destroy the evil I see. Mission accomplished. You were super, Professor. But how'd you ever do it? Oh, very simple, Nancy. You see, the ultraviolet rays from this germ-killing tube are sure death to airborne bacteria. Why, only two of these lamps in a schoolroom will purify the air as effectively as cross-ventilation, which completely changes the air every minute. These lamps can also be installed in air conditioning systems of large buildings to free the air of germs and protect the health of the workers. Well, Nancy, you've had a lot of excitement for one trip, huh? Oh, yes! Yeah. But I think you've had about enough for your first adventure with lamp magic. So hold on. We've followed your wonders near and far. Now, Light, take us home. Well, here we are. My, you certainly do get things done in super hurry, Professor. I've always believed in action instead of talk, Nancy. It's almost a rule where I come from. Where do you come from, Professor? You would never have told me, you know. Oh, how careless of me. I'll do better than tell you. I'll show you my home. Here. Slip these on for a moment. But, but they're so tiny. Are you sure, my dear? Well, well, don't sit there gaping. Put them on. Ah, fasten the ribbon so you won't break them. My only pair, you know. Now then. As soon as we get the magic sphere in focus. Ah, here it comes. There we are. Naturally, I spend a good deal of time in the laboratories at Neela Park, the headquarters of the General Electric Lamp Department. What's that big building with the light on top? That's the building in which we develop new lamps and standardize on materials, methods, and equipment so that no matter which factory they're made in, they'll be of the same uniform high quality. Why does it make so much light? That's where we test thousands of bulbs. Samples from every factory are tested to make sure that they're as good as we want them to be. Each one of the thousands and thousands of lamps tested is given a number when it comes into the testing room. And from that time on, a complete record of its performance is kept until it finally burns out. In this way, we know exactly how the lamps will perform. We can be sure they will give light at its best with the lowest possible cost for the use to which they are put. Another building houses the world famous Lighting Institute of Neela Park, which has become a school for the lighting industry. It has been a conference center since 1923 teaching how the results of research and manufacturing are put to work. Here, every imaginable kind of lighting is studied, from store windows designed to attract trade and sell goods, to sun decks for health and relaxation. We even work with black light that you can't see, but which makes certain materials glow, giving beauty to decoration. Here in the Institute, men and women from all over the world study how modern lighting can help to make their operations easier and more profitable. On an average, 30,000 of them come to the Institute every year. You know, Nancy, when you stop to think what our life would be like without light, you begin to realize the marvels of some of the things that we've been looking at. Light really is magic, isn't it, Professor? Magic indeed. Think of the magic in flicking a switch that instantly brings the glow of sunshine in a home at night. The joy of dining in a soft yet stimulating light. Uh, light is the color of decoration, the warmth of hospitality. It is safety from accidents and prowlers. Getting the family's meals day after day is a task, but it's a lot easier and more pleasant with good light. Glare-free and shadowless light is the protection for young eyes that have so much to learn, for most of our knowledge comes through our eyes. 
Good lighting is the comfort and relaxation that turns a house into a home. Truly, there's almost no limit to the jobs light does for us. Tiny lamps are the indicators in the nervous system of our civilization and in our daily work. Giant lamps are the sentinels guiding our far-flung commerce in the air and on the sea. Light is a protector in the hands of law and order, a public safeguard, and aid to business. A helping hand on the farm. It is our friend in times of trouble and our comrade in times of joy. Exciting. Relaxing. Entertaining. Revealing. Life-giving. Yes, Nancy. Way of life could not exist without light. Hundred of uniformity. An organization dedicated to the purpose of making a product that contributes to easier, more productive, and more pleasant living, and whose ideal has always been the fostering of intensive research to make lamps that stay brighter longer. Well, Nancy, it's been a real treat for the old professor to show you some of his magic lamps. But now it's time for him to go to work again. Production, you know. Research, efficiency, carry on and all that. Goodbye. Oh, uh, oh, my glass, my only pair, you know. But, but they're too big now. Tut, tut, now. Are you sure? Thank you, Nancy. Now be sure to put this new bulb in the lamp. And, Nancy. Don't forget your old friend, the professor. But above all, never forget the importance of light. Thank you.